Hi, I'm Rick Dior, and today we're going to investigate some really unique percussion instruments. Some strange, maybe scary sounds, and we'll do this in three videos. Uh, the first one will be these instruments, which I'll introduce in a minute. The next one will be whistles and horns, and finally other strange various percussion instruments you may or may not have encountered. So these instruments are called waterphones. They're one of my favorite extra percussion instrument, sort of a UFO of the percussion family, an identified instrument. And um, they're made by a gentleman who I believe is still living, still with us, named Richard Waters. And he invented these back in, um, I believe, 1968, maybe 1969. Uh, and I, originally they were used to call whales. Um, anyway, that's what, what he said. <laughs> and he has a patent on them. Uh, and there have been copies throughout the years that I've seen, but they're not even close in quality. And I'll show you some of those, or at least one of them, in, in a little bit. Um, these instruments are made of stainless steel, which is a good thing because you will put water in them. There's no water in them now, we're saving that for later. But I just wanted to show you what they sound like without water. Now all of you uh, have heard these if you watch scary movies. Uh, you know, when someone's about to get attacked or otherwise brutally bludgeoned, you might hear one of these sounds. It almost got to a point of cliche uh, and you didn't hear it for a while. But, uh, it does turn up, and mostly now they're played sampled. In other words, several people sampled these for libraries years ago, and they became played, you know, by a keyboard player as samples. So rarely do you run into the real ones. I, however, purchased these back in the late 1980s from a buddy of mine, uh, Barry Greenspan, in Drummer's World in New York, which is no longer there. And they were very expensive back then. God only knows what they cost now. <laughs> Someone told me recently that they no longer make this one for whatever reason, but they do make the others. So you might want to check online about that. But they were expensive then, and I'm sure they're four times as much now. But to me, it's worth it because it's such a great sound. And, you know, when I find an instrument that someone makes that's just one of a kind, I have to have it no matter what. So I have uh, three of these. I have a base, which is 16 inches, even bigger than this. And at this point, at my older age, it becomes kind of heavy to lift for a while. So I leave that one upstairs, um, and it wouldn't even fit on this table. But it's the same as this, just a little bigger and a lot heavier. This one is, I believe, called the standard water phone. And again, apparently he's not making these anymore. This is the best one, I think, because it's very light. It fits um, in a percussion setup if you need to use it. It doesn't take up a lot of space. Uh, and it's got a really hot, high range, excuse me. <laughs> it's got a really high range to it, um, which is really desirable, so it cuts through anything. Now, uh, recently with the orchestra, we've been playing a lot of these movie soundtracks, like, you know, all the John Williams stuff, you know, the Harry Potter movies, all the Star Wars stuff, Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, we, that's a big thing for orchestras now. They're playing these movie soundtracks and uh, they show the movie and they fill the hall up and they sell great. So we do maybe five or six of those a year. They're obviously very difficult because you got to play the whole movie score with one rehearsal and, and sometimes you only perform it once. And actually almost every John Williams score, uh, except for Home Alone, I think, uh, asks for a water phone. So uh, he apparently was aware or is aware of these and um, and so I get to bring my water phone and play it with the orchestra, which is rare. And I'll tell you another quick story. Um, I was doing a show, a Broadway show called Wicked, and it was on tour. And um, you know, I do all those tours that come to Charlotte uh, that aren't self-contained. And this is years and years ago. I think it was the first tour, probably. I mean, like maybe 2011 or something. And I'll have to look back. But I've done it four times. We're about to do it again if it doesn't get canceled here with this pandemic. But it usually comes for a month, and it's great, pays great, great show, lots of fun. But the first ever rehearsal that I did with it, uh, we only get one rehearsal for these shows, and then we do the show, so it, you gotta be prepared. 
uh, the show called for a water foam. And it said on the rider uh, that they would bring their own. So kind of had a feeling it wasn't going to be very good. So I brought mine. And the first rehearsal, there's a big water foam solo at the end of one of these pieces. It's the only thing playing. It's loud. And uh, I played this water foam and I did this. And the conductor stopped everything and looked at me and said, what is that? <laughs> and I said, that's a, that's a real water foam. Their water foam was some crappy little knockoff that had made no sound. And he just was like, he looked at the drummer and he said, he just looked at him and the drummer said, yeah, that's a real water foam. And they had never seen one. They just heard him. So he was overjoyed. And even off the, I believe they even offered to purchase it <laughs> from me for the rest of the tour. But um, uh, that could have been another wicked tour, but I think it was the first one. But one of them did, and I said, no way. But because, you know, I guess they could not get these anymore and he had stopped making them. But that's the difference between a real one and a fake, okay? Uh, now, when you put water in these things, it changes the pitch, so we'll just add a little water. I use distilled water, by the way. Um, it just, just doesn't have, um, I think, some of the corrosion in it. Once I left water in uh, my other crappy water foam, which I'll show you here, and I left it in there by accident, and it messed it up pretty bad. So after that, what I would do is just use all distilled water and then dump these out uh, and then dry them. I know that seems excessive, but, you know, I don't want to ruin these. But they're stainless steel, so that's another reason to buy good water foam. Now, I'll show you my other water foam. So this is my Rode water foam, and this is a knockoff, okay? Uh, it's actually the best knockoff I've seen. It's not bad, but it's some sort of brass or copper. It's much lighter. You'll see the tines are spread out more, so uh, the tuning isn't going to be as probably exclusive. And by the way, he tunes these in a microtonal scale uh, going up and then down. So as you go around with a full bow curve there, you're getting an up and down scale. That's what's responsible for that really cool sound, uh, all those tonalities. Uh, it's not like you're going to play a tune on the thing, you know, because it's microtonal. But he tunes each one, obviously spends a ton of time. These tines here are solid. They're not hollow. Some people ask me that. Okay. And this instrument is about twice as heavy as this one because it's stainless steel. Now, this one doesn't sound bad. It's not bad at all. But you hear the difference. You probably hear the water there now, see? Changing the pitch. It also gives a nice splashing effect. So that's an obvious difference, right? Okay. So it's a big, it's like playing some Pearl Export drums versus, you know, their best drums. That's, that's how I look at it, that kind of thing. So with water in here, you, you can put a lot or a little. With a little, you can hear the pitch fluctuation there. Now, if I put more in, Obviously, this is a big instrument, and it will take a lot of water. You never want to fill it to the, to the top or put flowers in it, okay? <laughs> so, this is what it sounds like. So you probably hear those low subtones like you hear a uh, whale song. It's very similar, actually. And that's what the water does. It changes the pitch slightly, uh, something you can't really do with it uh, on your own. Now, another way of changing the pitch, though, is to put it on a timpani and actually bow it on the timpani like this. 
and move the pedal of the timpani up and down. That is a really cool effect. And I used that in some of my percussion ensemble compositions, um, most notably a one called one called Science Fiction. That's uh, for mo it's for a movie and percussion ensemble. So those kinds of effects are really really cool uh, to use um, on any kind of pedaled timpani, any kind of pedaled instrument uh, that you have. Even inside a piano, I've done that. Mike did inside a grand piano and have someone hit a low note and then play the water phone. It actually sets it off it's, and mic it really close and really hot. It's an incredible, incredible sound. The other way you can play these is with a Super Bowl mallet. So these are these Emil Richards Super Bowl mallets, Super Bowl mallets. And I have two different sizes. I'll show you what they sound like. So here's the big one. Now, you, these are great. You can use these on gongs, on cymbals, on floor toms. They create automatic um, friction. So it's real easy. And, and it's, again, for movie soundtracks, it's really common to have that, that gong scrape, that growl. Okay, with this thing, kind of a pitch bend. And then on a little one, it sounds like this, not much space here. <laughs> sounds like my stomach in the morning. And the little Super Bowl mallet is much less sound. <laughs> So that's for a lighter kind of sound, all right? You can also use these on the tines. darkness personified all right as far as bows I like a horsehair bow uh, they do not last long as you see even today I've lost some hairs uh, so if if you don't want to keep paying to have it restrung uh, you can um, just use a synthetic bow like this they sound good they just don't have the grip I just have to use extra rosin and by the way the best rosin for this is a rosin called pops uh, one of my um, string bass player friends recommended it years ago, and I've used it. It's just wonderful, and that's the best. It's not too sticky. It's just perfect for this. So that's the synthetic bow versus the horsehair bow. So there's a big difference in that. Uh, obviously, you hear it. And they're both rosined up pretty good. Uh, the horsehair bows just has much more grip. So that's what I recommend. Again, more expensive. This is a fairly expensive bow, a couple hundred dollars. All right, this one is, I don't know, 40 bucks maybe. So, uh, you know, if you're going to take them out a lot or whatever, you might want to go with a cheap bow. The other thing you can use, uh, by the way, these are bass bows. I don't think I said that. It's a bigger um, surface area. So that's a must for the bigger water phone. But on the smaller water phone, you can use a violin bow or a viola bow, okay? So that's a smaller sound. So that sound might be more desirable to have just a really light sound and that'll give it to you. It doesn't really get any of the low end on the instruments and the bow's much lighter. And this is also a real horsehair bow. Okay, so we'll put this away. Okay, good. Uh, so we explained the difference between the cheap one, you see the spaces in there, okay, and also the bottom doesn't ring as much. So if you have the money and you find one used, I have seen them used before, I would maybe pick one up if you like the kind of sound and uh, you play a lot professionally. Uh, a lot of times, you know, I rent these out uh, not these, but that one, <laughs> the cheaper one, to the orchestra, you know, if they need it. So I make some extra money there. 
um, and I've rented out. Evelyn Glennie rented one of these. I did rent one of these to her for a show once um, in the States. And so, you know, people will will rent them out. You know, they're just they're musical instruments. They're worth having. So I'll play a little for you, and then we'll call it a day on the water phone. All right? Thank you. 